Morning. So I'm Katie and I'm going to talk about how to learn a language by watching films and TV. So just to get an idea of who we've got in the room, put your hand up if you already use films and TV to learn a language. Lots of people. Films and TV. And put your hand up if you find captions useful. So these are great in the same language as the language you're listening to. And put your hand up if you find subtitles useful. Great, so subtitles, that's when you're listening in the language you're learning and you're reading in your native language. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's an interesting reaction and we'll come back to this. Because in this talk, aside from learning about my really, really questionable taste in TV programs, <laughs> we're gonna talk about some of these questions and we're also going to talk about five really practical activities you can do to learn a language at home with TV and films. But first, <laughs> I'd just like to quickly mention that I'm absolutely baffled to be standing here in front of a room of polyglots talking about languages. Because I always used to think that people who could speak foreign languages were a little bit weird. Don't get me wrong, I was amazed by it and I was really jealous of the way you could just open your mouth and start speaking to somebody from another culture but I didn't understand the process of how you got there because my experience of learning languages was at school which looked like this so just trying to memorize lists of vocabulary based around topics and as I started to get older my experience of learning languages looked like this memorizing grammar conjugations. And so I did years of language classes at school in this way, and I still couldn't speak any languages apart from a few random phrases like, donde esta la biblioteca? <laughs> so my assumption about people who were good at foreign languages was just that they really, really liked remembering lists. And I think that this assumption is a very common assumption amongst monolinguals. Because now I'm on the other side of things, and I, I love learning languages, I've learned a few foreign languages, and for my job via my blog, Joe of Languages, I also help other people learn languages. But despite all of this, I still haven't found a good way to convince my friends and family that I didn't just get really good at memorizing lists. So what did happen? Well, in my third year of university, I got the chance to do a year abroad in Italy. But before I left, I'd already noticed that people who did years abroad, they came back and they seemed to fit into one of two categories. So by far the most common category were the people who went there, they spent the whole year kind of partying with the international students and they had a really good time, but they didn't come back speaking the language. And there was a much smaller but much more interesting group of people who seemed to be able to integrate with the people and the culture, they made friends and they came back speaking the language. So before I left, I thought I definitely, definitely want to be in the second group. So I set myself a challenge that I wasn't allowed to have any friends who I spoke English with. When I was in Italy, I could only socialize with people in Italian. And at the beginning, this was extremely difficult and extremely lonely because I'd done some Italian classes before I went, but my Italian skills were very much kind of me, Tarzan, you, Jane. And <laughs> When your language skills are so limited, it's quite difficult to make friends. But I got very, very lucky, and I met a group of people who liked the same music as me, and they were happy to be patient and help me to speak, as long as I let them teach me all the good swear words. <laughs> so after a few months of this to a year, I ended up being able to speak Italian. And that's when I realized that no amount of memorizing lists was going to help me to speak a foreign language. If I wanted to speak a foreign language, what I really had to do was to get out there and to start communicating with people, even if it was really difficult at first. And this is when I fell in love with the process of learning languages as well, because I realized that languages are fun, they're sociable, they're all about connecting with people. So I decided to try again with another foreign language, this time French. And imagine how happy I was when I was just thinking about learning French, and by pure coincidence, I ended up moving in with two French guys. So I thought, <laughs> perfect, you know, I'm gonna start speaking to them and in a year I'll be fluent. But it didn't work out that way this time. Because my French was very basic and apart from a few cute phrases like bonne nuit uh, before we went to bed, they didn't really want to speak to me in French. 
which is kind of understandable because speaking to me was very difficult. So what I would have been asking them to do was to be my French teachers 24-7. And they didn't want to do that, which is totally understandable. They wanted to socialize instead. So my French speaking didn't get any better at all. I kind of st continued studying French a little bit on my own with tapes and books and things, but certainly couldn't speak it. And then I did something which meant that later on down the line, I got to enjoy the looks on their faces when I started speaking French. Um, and also now, we're, we're still friends, and they're the ones who often start speaking to me in French because we can now, and it's fun. So I'm really glad that we're all friends here, because to tell you what I did, I'm going to have to reveal my deep, dark, secret shame. <laughs> <laughs> so I started watching lots and lots of French TV, the really bad but really addictive stuff, <laughs> like reality TV, cheesy soap operas. Uh, in, in the UK, sometimes we like to call this TV car crash TV, because it's the kind of TV, it's so bad, you know you shouldn't look, but then when you do look, you can't look away. <laughs> so I kept doing this. I, I tried to watch about one episode a day, but often if it ended on a really good cliffhanger, I'd actually end up watching much more than that. And at first, I didn't understand a whole lot, but I could pick up little bits of what was going on from the French that I'd been studying before, and especially given that these type of TV programs don't have particularly complicated plot lines. So I kept it up, and over time, I started understanding more and more, until I got to the point where I realized I could understand almost everything. And I started speaking to French people online on Skype. And I kept this up, and I realized that in conversation over time, I was able to use a lot of the words and phrases that I'd been listening to on TV. So I kept going, and I ended up being able to speak French fairly well. So I thought I'd try the same with Spanish, Mexican telenovelas, and speaking to Spanish people on Skype. And over, the, over time, I ended up being able to speak, or starting to be able to speak Spanish as well. And I'm not the only person who has used TV to learn a language. A really interesting case of this is Italy. So back in the 1950s, only 20% of Italians spoke standard Italian. Everybody else spoke dialects. So if you were in Milan, you spoke Milanese. If you were in Sicily, you spoke Sicilian. And the two would not be able to communicate, necessarily. They're, they're linguistically classed as different languages, as different as French and Spanish. And if you think about it, this is not really so long ago, the 1950s, this is the grandparent generation. So many of these people are still alive. So what happened that led to the spread of standard Italian so quickly, just in one generation? Many experts believe that one of the main players was the introduction of national television, La Rai, in 1954. And if you listen to TV enough, uh, so in this way, Italians were constantly being exposed to to standard Italian over time as more and more Italians got TV. And I think we can see lots of cases of this. If we listen to TV enough, you can kind of start speaking like the people you listen to. Uh, often many people who speak fantastic English tend to speak it with an American accent because of the films and TV programs they're watching. And I certainly found that this happened with me. Uh, with French, at first, I started to prepare for my French C1 exam, and at first, my teacher was very complimentary, said, oh, wow, your pronunciation's great, and she couldn't believe that I spoke so naturally, being that I'd never lived in France. But this was very short-lived, because I was preparing for an academic exam, and she soon started tearing her hair out over how limited my vocabulary was. And if you think about it, this makes sense, because the type of programs I was watching, the people aren't exactly known for their verbal intelligence. And similarly with Spanish, in the very, very early days, I started speaking Spanish with this really dramatic <laughs> intonation. <laughs> to the point where my partner, who understands Spanish, turned around to me and he said, you sound like a Mexican telenovela, it's really creepy. <laughs> you have to stop. <laughs> but fortunately, that was just in the early days. Things have moved on a little bit since then. And this makes sense if we think about how we connect with TV characters, almost as if they were real people. In Brazil, since the 1970s, there's a really interesting case of how uh, fertility rates have been dropping, and many people believe that it's linked in some, to some degree to the introduction of soap operas, because people are s constantly watching um, characters and families who have smaller families, and they identify with them, so they have smaller families themselves. 
And similarly, there's an effect called social facilitation, where we tend to do better on very simple tasks and not so well on very difficult tasks when we're, when we're in a group compared to when we're alone. And research has actually indicated that just by showing us a picture of our favorite TV character, we then perform tasks in this way. So it's almost as if we actually had them in the room with us. So languages are all about people. If you don't have real people, then films and TV are the next best thing. But the best thing about these people is you can pause them and you can rewind them. <laughs> and they come with subtitles. So in the rest of this talk, we're going to look at five ways to learn a language with films and TV. Here are some of the techniques we're going to look at. But first, you'll need to find something you feel excited about watching. So if I've got you worried talking about soaps and reality TV, don't worry, you don't have to watch them. If you like sci-fi, you can watch sci-fi. Um, if you like the news, you can watch the news. But the important thing is that you find something that makes you really interested to find out what they're saying. Because learning to understand a language is a bit like cracking a code. And if you really want to know what the message is on the other side, then you'll have a lot more, it will be much easier to dedicate the time and energy that you need to dedicate to it to be able to do it. And then the next step, if you can find captions or a transcript, this is ideal so that you can read what they're saying and work on a deeper level with the language. So the first activity on my list is dictation. And I wanted to actually practice doing this, so to do a dictation all together. But I couldn't think of a language. In fact, I don't think there is a language that we are all learning to a similar level. So instead, I've decided to teach you a little bit of my native language, which is the Derbyshire dialect, which is uh, just under there, kind of nestled between Manchester and Sheffield, just under Sheffield. So what you will need is a pen and a paper so that you can write what you hear. If you don't have a pen and a paper, then um, a phone will do as well. Ready? Okay, so it goes fast, so you need to be poised. Oh no, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. To be honest with you, I don't really like leaving Chesterfield, because if I go somewhere, I'll well, about get there, and they'll not be able to understand what I'm on about. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to listen again? <laughs> Turn it up. I'll be honest with you, I don't really like leaving Chesterfield because if I go somewhere, I'll well, about get there and they'll not be able to understand what I'm on about. <laughs> you can check with people sitting next to you if you want some help as well, see if anybody else understood anymore. I'll be honest with you, I don't really like leaving Chesterfield because if I go somewhere, I'll well, about get there and they'll not be able to understand what I'm on about. so difficult to understand in Derbyshire. <laughs> so if you're doing this to learn a foreign language, then you can do this as many times as you can until by listening to it over and over, you can't get any more information. Then you can turn on the captions and check what you said uh, or check what you wrote against the captions. So let's do this now. Um, can you read the captions OK? Uh, if not, I'll, I'll read it out afterwards, just in case any of you can't see them very well. So we've got the first line, I'll be honest with you, I don't really like leaving Chesterfield. I'll be honest with you, I don't really like leaving Chesterfield, because if I go some... 
Because if I go somewhere? Because if I go somewhere? Where I can live out again. And then we... <laughs> We've got happen, which is what happens is that. There, a bit. I'll about get there, which is like when I get there, or just as I get there. To understand what I'm wondering. And they'll not be able to. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, and they'll not be able to, they won't be able to understand what I'm on about, understand what I'm talking about. So then the next step, I'll just come around so I can see you all better. It's like, so that the next step, and this is really the most important step, is look at what you wrote and look at the captions and then ask yourself what's different. So this is not the moment when you get out the whip and you start beating yourself up for being so bad at listening in the language. This is really, really good information. It's really specific information about what's different between um, how you understood it and how people actually say it. So it's really specific information about why you don't understand the language. And now you have this specific information, you can learn it and you'll have a much better chance of understanding next time. So you can ask yourself the question, why didn't I understand? And it's usually due to one of two things. So it could be because it's new words or new grammar that you didn't know. And if it seems like these words and grammar will be useful for you for communication, then you can go away and investigate a little bit and try and learn them. Or one thing that happens extremely often, um, as I think happened in this case a lot, is that you actually know the words, but they were pronounced differently to how you expected them. So we had be able to, which was actually be able to. And this doesn't just happen in Derbyshire. Uh, this happens in every foreign language, and it's one of the main reasons why reading is so much simpler than listening. So we've got, for example, in English, we've got, where do you want to go? Do you becomes do. And in French, we've got, je suis contente, je suis contente, I'm happy. And this probably happens in the language that you're learning as well. And it's one of the main reasons why listening is so difficult as well. Even if you're at a very advanced level, it can still be difficult to understand native speakers when they speak together and to understand films made for native speakers because they do this all the time. They smush words together in a way that we may not be expecting. So if you do this activity and you really train your ears to understand what happens and, and how native speakers smush the words together, because it's usually predictable, so once you get used to it, you'll come across it again and again then you'll really, really improve your listening. Next, reading. So who likes reading as a way to learn a foreign language? Great, lots of people. I've noticed that polyglots often do. It seems to be a polyglot favorite, lots of reading. And with good reason, because reading is a lovely way to learn a foreign language. Um, you can, with reading, you can learn vocabulary incidentally. So there's research that shows that you can pick up vocabulary via reading um, rather than, for example, sitting and trying to memorize a list of words. There's a huge debate over whether this is the most effective or the fastest way, but we know that this definitely happens and it's certainly an enjoyable way. And I've been experimenting with this recently and I've really enjoyed it. To explain how, I'm gonna have to take you back to a few months ago when I was really struggling with my motivation for Mandarin Chinese. Because usually when I learn a language, I like to try and, I'll start with some books and tapes, but I like to try and get onto materials for native speakers like films and TV as quickly as I can, because I enjoy it more and I find it more motivating. But with Chinese, the jump is huge from learner materials and textbooks to TV programs made for Chinese speakers. It's a really big jump. And I know that some of you have had similar problems because we've talked about this before. But I knew I had to do something because I was losing motivation incredibly fast. I couldn't face looking at another textbook. So I decided to start trying to watch TV in Chinese. And it was reasonably useful at the beginning. It helped me to start to pick up some of the words and phrases that I'd been learning. But too much of it was just flying over my head. I wasn't understanding any of it. So I decided to instead to try and read the TV. So I turned on the subtitles 
and tried reading the TV. <laughs> and it turns out that reading the TV is actually a lot more fun than reading a book because you've got all of this visual information. You can see what's going on. Um, you can see what their, the character's emotions are. You can see where they are. Uh, but there was only a couple of problems with this technique. The first was that I didn't really know how to read Chinese. Uh, so I'd been doing little bits um, with textbooks and things like that, but it was definitely very basic. My reading, Chinese, uh, my reading skills in Chinese were very basic. And the other problem is that being as my reading skills were very basic, I had to look up a lot of words. And how do you look up words in a Chinese dictionary? You can't just type them like in other languages because you have the characters. So what I had to do, I downloaded an app on my phone where I could draw the characters with my finger. So I did this uh, for one 40-minute episode, the first episode in the series. Can you guess how long it took me? <laughs> 18 hours. <laughs> Not all in one go, of course. Uh, so that was 18 hours over about three weeks. And I think the main reason it took so long was because the cognitive load was so huge. So by the time I'd got to the end of a sentence, I'd forgotten what the beginning of the sentence said. <laughs> so I found myself having to write a lot down. So, so far, not so good, really. But the interesting thing is the second episode took me six hours. And I think the main reason for this is, is because by far the highest proportion of words that we see when we're reading, particularly in simplish things like TV series, are the very, very common words, so things like and and the. And with 18 hours of the first episode, I'd already learned to read all of those. So by the second one, I was just looking up the words that I didn't know. And then I've carried on kind of steadily improving since then. So what happens if we read the TV in this way? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, studies indicate that we can learn vocabulary incidentally in this way, much like with reading. But what about listening skills? If we're reading the TV, won't we just get lazy and stop listening and stop improving our listening skills? Interestingly, research seems to indicate that this doesn't really happen. We can watch TV with captions and our, English, uh, our listening skills can keep improving. And there's even a study that indicates that um, a group in the study who used captions and listening showed more improvements in their listening compared to the group who didn't use captions. And the researchers suggested that this could be because this helped that, that group to link the, the words that they were reading to the sounds that they were hearing. And what about subtitles in your first language? So I saw for, these are not very popular <laughs> in the room. Um, and the research on this is very mixed. Um, we know that it's definitely better than nothing because we know that, for example, um, countries who import American films and TV programs and they use subtitles rather than dubbing have better English skills compared to the countries who use dubbing. But interestingly, and I think similarly um, to how many of you feel instinctively, is that the study that I just mentioned, they also did it with a group of uh, people who listened in their native language, uh, sorry, they listened in the language they were learning and they read in subtitles in their native language and they didn't show any improvements in their listening skills. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it because it's very easy um, when you have subtitles in your native language just to kind of switch off your brain so you're not really engaging with the language in a way. And the more that we engage with the language, the more that we can learn. So next on my list is bi-directional translations. So this is when you take either a, f a scene from a film or a TV program and you translate it into your native language and then the next day you come back and you translate it back into the language you're learning. And then you compare the two, so what you wrote and the language and the original. So here, this is the way that I do it. I know other people do it in different ways. Um, so the first day, I'll write this kind of weird foreign English because I'm not, interest, I'm not a translator, I'm not interested in writing English that sounds perfect. I'm interested in knowing that I understood the meaning and I'm also really interested in starting to look at the differences between the sentence structures and the way that the two languages express things. So for example, you'll see I've got this weird sounding sentence which is, um, this is in Spanish, um, and I've got... Where is it? Yeah, this shirt could be of anyone. So this could be anyone's shirt. 
But writing it in this way helps me to start to focus on how Spanish speakers would express this idea. Then I'll also leave notes for future me. So if there's anything that I think might be difficult, when I I'll, I'll be using these notes to do the translation tomorrow. So if there's anything I think might be difficult, like a new word, I'll leave myself a little clue, like the first letter of the word, or if there's grammar that I think might be difficult, I'll make a note of it. And then the next day, I come back, and I'll use these notes to recreate the original. And then, again, the most important step, I'll look at what I wrote, and I'll look at the original, and then I'll really get into what's different. And again, this, like the dictation, this is not the moment when you get out the whip and start beating yourself and up and crying about how bad you are at the language you're learning. This is the whole point of this exercise. We want lots of mistakes. If you don't have lots of mistakes, if there's no difference, this means that you're not challenging yourself enough. It's too easy. You need something more difficult. So here we've got this really practical list of things that are different between the way that you express something and the way that a native speaker might express something. So you can actually learn this list now and that will help you to express things in a way that a native speaker would. Uh, so one thing you can do, you can write yourself little quiz questions maybe. Um, you could simply come back and review it in your notebook. Or you could even make yourself flashcards with a space where you made the mistake. So you keep coming back and quizzing yourself. And um, so this method, um, Luca Lampariello speaks a lot about this. So if you're interested, uh, I think he does it in a slightly different way. But if you're interested, I definitely recommend looking at some of his stuff. Next, conversation starters. So if you meet with people to practice speaking the language, um, you can use some of the things that you watch, the TV and films, as conversation starters, so you can actually speak to them, speak about them in your conversation practice. Um, and this is a good way because it helps you take what you've been listening to and transfer it into active knowledge that you can, words and grammar that you can use in conversation. So there are a few different ways that you can do this. Uh, you could write summaries or uh, take notes on things that you think are interesting that you'd like to talk about. Um, and you can get your partner maybe to help you to correct the notes first, and then you can use what you wrote as a springboard for a conversation. Another thing you can do is you can actually write questions for your conversation, either about the topic or with some new words that you've learnt. So, for example, um, this is a word that I learnt recently in Chinese, fan, which means either annoying or to be annoyed. And I'm just going to have to come around again. And so I wrote a question with this word in the question so that I could discuss it with my conversation partner. Uh, so my question was, um, when you are annoyed, um, what ways do you have to calm down? Um, and then we carried on the conversation. So my tutor told me what he does to calm down, and then I spoke, well, what he does when he's annoyed. I spoke about what I do when I'm annoyed. And by the end of the conversation, we'd used this word so many times that it was really easy for me to remember. Oh, I knew this was going to happen. So the last thing, um, if all else fails, is you can just put the TV on and watch it. If you're intermediate level and above, this is always going to be good because it's always more exposure, always more input, more listening practice. Uh, if you're a lower level and it really is just 
all flying over your head. I don't think it's as useful, because I don't believe that you can learn a language via osmosis. You have to be engaging with the meaning and trying to understand in some way. However, there are a few hidden benefits to doing this occasionally. Um, the first is that it can help you to get used to the sound system. And the second is that I find that it's extremely useful for helping you to stay in your routine. So for example, on those days where you, you were so busy or so tired, you would have done absolutely nothing. Something is always better than nothing. So I'm sure you can probably find 15 minutes to half an hour just to put the TV on and sit there for a little bit. And I found another hidden benefit with this with Chinese, which was that before I started reading, I was just watching it and a lot of it was flying over my head, but I could still see what was going on. So I knew at the end of one episode, they had a big argument and one of them stormed out of the room. So this created this big curiosity gap where I really wanted to know what happened. What, what did they say to each other to get them so annoyed? So I ended up being a lot more motivated to go back and then work with the language points and start reading the TV. Uh, because I wanted to know what they were saying to each other. But what if it's too difficult? So one thing you can do if, if it's really difficult, I think the most important thing is to choose something that you're really, really interested in, because the more interested you are, um, the easier it, it will be to stay motivated. And the next thing is you can make it easier to follow, and there are a few different ways you can do this. So um, I'm sure many of you might know the TV series Extra on YouTube. It's like a cheesy version of Friends for language learners, uh, where the language is very simple and they speak slower. Um, or there's also the Easy Languages videos. Um, we've started working on the Easy, language, Easy Italian team because it's a really, really nice project. Um, they go out and they interview native speakers in the streets. Um, the episodes are very short, about five minutes long, so it's, and you have subtitles as well, so it's a really nice, gentle introduction to understanding real native speech. A couple of YouTube hacks. So um, many of you will already know this, but not everybody does. Um, you can use the keyboard to control videos on YouTube, and this makes it much easier. So you can use the space bar to pause it and play it, most importantly, you can use the back key to skip back five seconds, which is great if, you, if there's a little bit you didn't understand and you want to keep going back. And you can also click on the cog to adjust the speed. So you can slow it down to about 75%. Um, I wouldn't recommend going any slower than that because otherwise they just sound drunk. Um, <laughs> but it's nice to slow it down a little bit. And another thing that's interesting, you can actually speed it up as well. So you can... Um, if it feels too fast, if you get used to it even faster, then once you get used to it at a normal speed, it suddenly feels a lot easier. And finally, I just want to end by showing you a couple of my favorite new toys. This one is LLN, so Language Learning with Netflix. It's a Chrome uh, extension. So if you install this on Google Chrome, you have a little button in Netflix, and when you click it, you get subtitles in the language you're learning, or captions, should I say. And the great thing is they're interactive, so you can click on them, and it will give you the definition of the word. And at the moment, as far as I'm aware, the Asian languages aren't very well supported. So if you're learning something like Japanese or Chinese or Korean, um, there's another great website, which is Viki, Learn Mode on Viki. Um, you have essentially the same function. So you've got interactive subtitles where you can click on them and get the definition. So I don't believe that there is one easy way to learn a language. I don't believe there's any easy way to learn a language. It always takes time and effort. But I think that if we can do it watching our favorite TV programs, then it's the closest thing that we have. And imagine if you can start binge watching TV in the language you're learning, just think how much more listening practice you'll get and how much more you'll learn. So, if you're interested in finding out more about this, I have a blog post on this as well. It's five smart ways to learn a language by watching TV and films. Thank you very much for listening. Right. We have questions, it's I think. Chinese. <laughs> Not well enough to read a question in Chinese. <laughs> Okay, great. 
Uh, so there's um, a really great question. Um, do you prefer or find more useful storytelling shows, series, movies, or rather news discussions and stuff like Good Morning Italy? That's yeah, a really interesting question. And I think it depends completely on your goals. So for example, if your goal is to just have kind of relaxed conversations, then soap operas are great for that because you hear people having relaxed conversations. Whereas if your goal is maybe to pass an exam, um, like when I was preparing for the French exam, I suddenly had to start watching lots of news programs because th they were the programs that had the vocabulary that I needed to do what I wanted to do in the language. So you can ask yourself, what do you want to do with the language? Which programs may have similar language that will help you to do that? But also I think motivation comes into it as well. So whichever type of program you like watching the most, you will want to watch the most. So that will ultimately be the most useful, I think. Do you speak Chinese now? Uh, <laughs> do I speak Chinese now? Um, a bit. <laughs> Not perfectly, but I, I'm getting there. And I feel like if I keep it up um, with online classes and reading the TV, and hopefully at some point I'll get to the point where I can understand it just by listening as well, um, then give me a couple of years and hopefully I will. Ah, uh, yeah, so another great question is um, what about when you have captions that don't match the, the, the audio, the most irritating thing, right? You're like, yes, I found the captions. Oh. Um, I find that really irritating as well. I don't necessarily have a good answer for it. Um, I think they're probably better than subtitles in your native language, definitely. Um, but I agree, I find them irritating and I prefer, if I can, to get exact subtitles, captions, sorry. And I think I've been really happy, with, I'm not advertising for them, I promise, but I've been really pleased with Netflix recently because I noticed that more and more of the captions do seem to be extremely similar to the dialogue, so it's very easy to use these type of activities with them. Ah, yeah, yeah, Fluent U. So um, there's, there's a company called Fluent U and they do, um, they have, they use little snippets, like little videos with interactive subtitles, like the ones we talked about. Um, I think it's really useful. I used it for a bit with Chinese. Um, after a while, I started to miss a long form story though, because uh, I found that just the little, the little adverts were nice, but I wanted to actually get a bit lost in a storyline and get attached to characters and follow what was happening, because that's what motivates me to keep watching TV. Whereas I, I felt that Fluent You didn't have that after a while. Great, yes, there's a, any tips on how to find good content, especially as a beginner? Um, this is, yeah, a great question and something that I think is frustrating for all of us because um, it feels like at the moment there's not, especially with Chinese again, um, but with other languages as well, there are not so many resources for beginners to be able to learn in this way, uh, so simplified things. Um, I think maybe as a complete beginner, it can be still good to start with a textbook, possibly, um, and then move on to the simpler things. So I think the things that I mentioned at the end of the talk, so um, if there are any TV shows that have been made simpler, um, like Extra, that's great, or if not, the little videos, for example, in the Easy Languages series. Um, with the way that interactive subtitles work now, you could essentially start doing this with, with any film. Um, it might be a bit slow and frustrating at the beginning, um, as I found with Chinese, but it's definitely possible now with these new tools. Okay. Thank you very much.